Hi, I'm Victor. I used to work on the Flutter team way back when. Now I'm the founder of ServerPod, where I work full time with Dart on the back end. I'm also the organizer of the Full Stack Flutter conference, which will most likely be held early next year. Today I'm going to talk about vibe coding full stack Dart. It's not just about how you build your front ends with Flutter, but also how you can build full stack apps with Dart. Let's first look at what vibe coding is. The term vibe coding was initially coined by Andre Karpathy. I won't read his full tweet here, but these are the highlights. There's a new kind of coding I call vibe coding, where you fully give in to the vibes, embrace exponentials, and forget that the code even exists. I accept all, always. When I get error messages, I just copy paste them in with no comment. Sometimes the LLM can't fix a bug, so I just work around it or ask for random changes until it goes away. That's the purest form of vibe coding, but there are a few different definitions. Depending on who you talk to, you'll get different takes. Some focus on the pure form where you only prompt and never look at the code. The next level is prompting, reviewing the code and occasionally doing manual fixes. Then some developers talk about vibe coding as just advanced autocomplete, like what you get in tools such as Cursor. We're all developers here, so I don't think we're too afraid to look at the code. We'll focus more on the middle definition. You prompt, you review, and you ask the AI to correct. And you occasionally do manual fixes yourself. Which tools should we use for this? There are plenty, and they change all the time. You have Cursor, Gemini CLI, Codex, Claude Code. Some tools like Dreamflow or Firebase Studio aim to be the most vibey, where you never even have to look at the code. Just the output. In this talk, we won't focus too much on the tools themselves, because tools change constantly. Instead, we'll focus on the principles. Just like when you learn to program, it's more important to learn the principles than focus on a single language. Once you know the principles, you can switch languages easily. It's the same here. Focus on principles, not specific tools. Personally, I've experimented the most with Cursor, Gemini CLI, and Codex. Cursor is the one that I've had the most luck with. One of the most important principles is context. Context is everything in vibe coding. The models only know what they've been trained on. They don't know your code base, new frameworks, or your specific project. All that needs to be provided in the context we give them. Context is basically all the information we send to the model alongside the prompt. LLMs don't have a real memory, so we need to keep that memory alive ourselves. The better context we provide, the better code we will get. But note, the longer the context, the worse the performance. These numbers are probably six months old, but still relevant. If you've worked with ChatGPT, you know that when it drifts off track, it rarely recovers. That's because of how context is handled. As you can see in this graph, performance already starts to deteriorate at just a few thousand tokens. Imagine what happens at millions of tokens. So keeping context short is important to maintain good performance. But how do we provide context? There are a couple of ways. First, the agent will look through some of our project files to learn about what we are building. Second, you can provide a product requirements document or a PRD together with an implementation plan. Third, you can provide an agents.md file, which contains initial instructions and rules provided to the agent. And then there are MCP servers, model context protocol servers, which can provide additional context. Let's start with a product requirements document. This is where you collect all the overarching information about your project. I typically use the agent to help write this as well. For example, to build an app for managing the full stack Flutter conference, I wrote, write a product requirements document or a PRD MD. I'm building a conference app with Flutter and ServerPod. I want to have three types of users, attendees, speakers, and admins. Then I obviously added all the other details about the app and the features I wanted. The agent will output a draft PRD, but you need to make sure it includes the right things. So. What do you need in your PRD? A description of your app and features as detailed as possible. Then 
the technologies you use, any design and UX considerations, any special data models or project structures you want to use. When you have this in place, you can create an implementation plan. I usually have the agent generate the plan based on the PRD. For example, I'll say, I'm building an app. Look at the requirements in the PRD.MD and make a full step-by-step -step implementation plan, a plan.MD document. Include the checklist for each step at the end. This produces a plan.MD with steps and checklists. The checklist is super useful because the agent can check off steps as it goes, which gives it a kind of memory for where it left off and what's next. Let's talk about the agents.md file. This is one of the first things included in the LLM's context after the system prompt. It's very important because models pay more attention to the beginning and the end of the context. In this file, you want a short project description, references to your PRD and plan, and instructions like always run dot format and dot analyze, always write and run tests. You also want to include information on how the agent should use MCP servers. Without those instructions, chances are your agent will never access the MCP servers you're providing. You can also point to additional context in the .agents directory. Here you can place additional information that must not be in the context of the agent for every single task, but it can look at it when it needs it. Every time the agent makes a mistake, Add a rule to your agent's file, and chances are smaller that it will make the same mistake again. In a way, this will serve as your agent's memory. You can also add context in the .agents directory. For example, I use ChadCN UI for Flutter. The models don't really know this library well, so I sent this prompt to the agent. Clone the documentation for ChadCN UI from GitHub. Then find all code examples create an individual markdown file for each widget with a minimal example of its usage. Place the files in the .agents slash ZCN UI directory. Let's look at the output we got from this. On the left side, you can see the files that it produced. We have a file for each widget in ZCN. I opened up the button and you can see that it has examples for each type of button, primary, secondary, and destructive buttons. Now, the agent has direct concrete examples to use. LLMs love examples. They work much better with examples than with just descriptions in text. And again, perhaps the most important tip for this talk. Whenever the agent gets something wrong, add instructions to the agent's file. The LLM doesn't have memory, but this gives it memory. Over time, your agents.md becomes a more powerful guide to the agent and you will get higher quality generations. Now let's talk about MCP servers. MCP stands for Model Context Protocol. It's a standardized way for agents to interact with external tools, data sources and services. They can provide tools, resources and prompts. The resources are basically just files and the prompts are templates for prompts the agent can use. However, in practice, the agents just call tools. So if you are writing your own MCP server, just use tools. If you want to expose a text file, make a tool that returns it rather than using a resource. MCP servers can run as processes or HTTP servers. They can expose things like commands, tests, file access, and other resources. For example, Dart has an MCP server that exposes things like pubget, and Dart test. In practice, the agents can call the command line tools directly, so actually provides pretty little value at this point. The real value of the MCP is providing better context. That's what we did for ServerPod and how we made it possible to vibe code with ServerPod. If you haven't heard about ServerPod, here's a quick summary. ServerPod is an open source, scalable backend framework written in Dart for Flutter. The way it works is simple. You create an endpoint class with methods. ServerPod analyzes your server code and generates a type safe client. In your Flutter app, you call server methods as if they were local methods. Pretty cool. The whole API is generated. 
you don't have to worry about building APIs or serialization. In this example, we create a hello method in an example endpoint. We run servpod generate, and now we can call the method from our Flutter app. You can return not just basic objects, but also complex serializable objects or streams. Serverpod handles real-time communication with Dart streams under the hood over WebSocket. It manages the lifecycle of the WebSocket and route calls automatically. Serverpod is scalable. It's great for hobby projects, but can scale to handle millions of users. You can deploy to any server that can run Dart or Docker. And we're building a Serverpod cloud for zero configuration deployments with auto-scaling, load balancing, domain names, and certificates. Serverpod is also built with AI native apps in mind, with support for vector databases and retrieval augmented generation. And of course, we made it great to use with code generation. Serverpod comes with batteries included. It has support for Postgres through its ORM with relations, joins, and migrations. It handles authentication, caching, health checks, logging, file uploads to S3 or Google Cloud, scheduling tasks with future calls, and streaming data. It has a great testing framework for creating integration tests. It's a really smooth developer experience. To make it easier to learn Serverpod, we built StarGuide. StarGuide lets you chat with your documentation. It uses a vector database and retrieval augmented generation to find relevant documentation and GitHub discussions. Then it crafts an answer. It's all open source if you want to see how we did it. When building our MCP server, we connected it to StarGuide. Now, when you use an agent like Cursor, it can connect to the MCP server, which can in turn ask StarGuide questions in natural language. StarGuide will look up relevant information and pass the answer back to the MCP server, which in turn passes it back to the coding agent and uses as part of its context. This hugely improves the performance of the agent, making Serverpod vibe codable. All right, let's go with the vibes. How do you do the actual prompting? First, pick the right model for the job. For me, ChatGPT5 works really well with Flutter and Dart code, though it's very slow. For quick tasks, I sometimes use smaller, faster models like Grok, but they tend to go wild on bigger tasks, and there will literally be crazy code all over the place. Generally, you will get better performance if you break things up into smaller steps. When you're building code, do it incrementally. Review the generated code, if it's just a prototype, maybe it's fine, but for real code, you need to review and either fix it or reprompt. Sometimes it's faster to fix manually than to keep prompting. Don't get stuck in a reprompting loop. Fix things manually if it's faster. Vibe coding is about improving our productivity after all, right? Finally, keep improving your context. Update your agents.md add examples, extend your MCP server. The reality is LLMs make a lot of mistakes. They take shortcuts almost always. They do the least amount of work to complete the task. They repeat code. Sometimes I found that they will even write two almost identical methods above each other rather than combining them into a single method. They fail to find existing widgets, constants, or methods. And instead they just write new ones instead. This is especially troubling with Flutter widgets that you want to reuse across screens. Having multiple copies will almost certainly bring them out of sync. They create inconsistent solutions for the same problems in different parts of your app. Often, they produce overly complex, non-standard solutions. They miss edge cases, which can create unexpected behaviors down the line. In tests, they often just just a happy path. So, these are all things you really have to watch out for. Here are some examples of what I have vibe coded. First, I built Cupertino Native as a proof of concept. When Apple released Liquid Glass in iOS 26, all the React Native bros came out to declare Flutter dead. I wanted to see if I could bring this effect into Flutter using platform views. I've never done platform views before, and I'm not a Swift developer perfect candidate for vibe coding.
after a weekend, I had a working proof of concept. And it's running at 120 frames per second with dozens of components on screen. Not production ready yet, but impressive and something that would have taken me weeks to do manually. Next, I'm building an app for our full stack Flutter conference. Last time we used Google Docs and Forms and it was painful. This time I'm vibe coding an app with Flutter and ServiPod. The app manages speaker submissions, organizer and moderators can rank and approve talks and create a schedule for the conference. I made it the challenge to never touch the code. When the code generation failed, I either improved the ServiPod MCP server or added rules to the agent's file. Now it works end to end, back into front end. So is it worth it? For things like UI scaffolding, back end glue code, writing tests and repetitive tasks? Yeah, it speeds you up. It's also great for prototyping. You can get stuff out really fast if you don't care too much about the quality. But remember, you still own testing, debugging and security. Generated code can be messy. If you add too much bad code to your code base, it becomes hard to maintain and the models will perform worse over time. And vibe coding can make you lazy. You don't want to lose your sharpness as a developer. So if something is faster to do by hand, do it yourself, stay sharp. And what about the future? Will the machines replace us developers? I asked ChatGPT to make this graph, so take it with a grain of salt. Uh, on the x-axis, you have training cost. On the y-axis, you have accuracy. Models lie roughly along a straight line. The problem though, is that the x-axis is logarithmic. That means as models get a little smarter, the cost to train them grows by orders of magnitude. To make ChatGPT 5, they already needed massive compute. To go further, the cost for the next iteration will be tenfold, then hundredfold. Where's this money going to come from? And how will it be possible to build the processors? And how much electricity will this require? I don't think it will be sustainable. LLMs may have hit a ceiling. To reach the next step, we probably need something beyond LLMs. There's a lot of money and resources going into this space, so maybe it will happen. But for now, I think developers are safe. Many other jobs will be automated before ours, and there'll be developers doing that automation. If you want to try all this out, you can find ServerPod MCP on pub.dev, and you can find ServerPod at ServerPod.dev. You can find me on Twitter, Blue Sky, or LinkedIn. Just search for Victor Lindholt. Don't hesitate to reach out. That's what I had for you today. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Happy coding.